So I'm going to pick up today where the NAS report left off. The NAS report said that DNA is the gold standard, but they were actually talking about a particular type of DNA. They were talking about single source DNA that comes from a single person, and that's where all the studies have been, and that's what you're used to. But in fact, most of the DNA evidence that see nowadays are mixtures that come from at least two sources, sometimes five, six, and a handgun. You can have lots of people. But most crimes actually involve DNA from two or more people, and these are called DNA mixtures. And the result is, is that there's a lot more work, double, double toil and trouble in interpreting them when people don't use computers. And that's what I'll be talking about for the next 20 minutes. So this is a case that I learned Paul Boas was involved in. And this was an inconclusive mixture. And this is what the crime lab report looked like. So this is typical mixture. Again, most evidence now is mixtures from crime labs. And this is the typical outcome. Uh, the conclusions for a swab of areas from a handgun, and I've just I paraphrased it slightly and anonymized the report. The data indicates the DNA from four or more contributors was obtained from the swab of the handgun. Due to the complexity of the data, no conclusions can be made regarding persons A and B as possible contributors to this mixture. So the laboratory gets the handgun, they swab it, they amplify the DNA, they run it through genetic analyzer, they get fantastic electronic data, and the usual answer is inconclusive. It can't be used for inculpatory or exculpatory purposes. That's the end of it. But in this case, Cybergenetics was asked to reanalyze the data from the handgun, and the match statistics provided information. In brief, here's evidence, say it's a handgun, and what true allele does is it unmixes the mixture. It separates out the genetic types of each of the people who'd contributed their DNA to that mixture and teases them apart, in this case, into the genetic types of four contributors. And in the process, it makes DNA easy again to understand because it's just like the old DNA when you only had one contributor. It's separated out. So you're looking at the genetic types of four different people. The third unknown contributor happened to match with a statistic of 400,000. Person B, that is a statistic that's high enough to indicate that they're included. And that person, after a plea bargain, went to jail. There were other people involved, but person A, who was Paul's client, was not matching any of these four contributors that were separated out from the handgun. And in fact, there was an exclusionary statistic and he wasn't interested in a plea bargain. And actually in the end, he was excluded and he went free. So all we can do is science, but by separating out mixtures, inconclusive data can be turned into actual information. It's also worth noting that this process is completely objective in that the computer is not looking at any of these people when it does the separation. It just takes the evidence, separates it, whatever it finds, it finds. So that's the process. The match between that contributor to the handgun and person B is 400,000 times more probable than a coincidence. I was originally going to tell you all about match statistics for 10 minutes, but I decided not to. You can check that online if you're interested. More interesting is that recently mixture statistics have been shutting down crime labs. Now, you may have been reading about this in the news. You can Google it and find out a lot more about it. For example, in the Washington Post this year, headlines, National Accreditation Board suspends all DNA testing at the DC crime lab before they shut it down completely. The argument was they didn't comply with FBI standards. You'll be hearing a lot about those FBI standards in the next 15 minutes. We also have in Texas in the last few months that new protocols for mixture interpretation lead to reviews of mixed DNA evidence. Almost 25,000 lab tests are affected and reviews are being done. This is happening around the country. Why? Well, is this brand new? No one's ever heard of it before. No, actually, 
the community was put on notice 10 years ago at least. A mixture of statistics, the way they've been done throughout most of the country, are just unreliable. The Commerce Department with the National Institute of Standards and Technology did a study in 2005. Uh, notably, it was never published. Most of these federal studies that showed limitations with these mixture interpretation methods were never published. They're just presented at conferences and the community knows about them. This was about the simplest data you can get, a two contributor mixture with a known victim, the sort of data that you would get with a sexual assault kit. Simple data. So when you think backlog after this talk, think about why are we spending a fortune to develop data that people can't interpret? But that's a different point. This is what the study showed, is that the same sample, the data from the sample, was sent to 50 to 100 crime labs, and many of them found it inconclusive. And of the labs that didn't, which were probably about half of the labs, the match statistics ranged from 31,000, that's like four zeros after the one, to 213 trillion, that's 14 zeros after the one. And as the scientists noted, their comment is, remember that these labs are interpreting the same data. Okay, so reliability usually doesn't mean it can be inconclusive or some number between 10,000 and 100 trillion, unless you're dealing with DNA mixtures. So they were put on notice. And in fact, there'll be a paper coming out soon. Anybody heard of the word CPI? So CPI is the combined probability of inclusion. That's the method that's been used on hundreds of thousands of mixtures in this country and around the world. And this is the title of the paper that talks about why CPI is unreliable. The title is, Inclusion Probability for DNA Mixtures is a Subjective, One-Sided Match Statistic Unrelated to Identification Information. Okay, what does that mean? It's subjective. The only way you can use the method is to compare the data with the person you want to include. It's a one-sided statistic. It only produces inclusionary values. If it's not inclusionary, then that particular test isn't used. It's unrelated to identification information. Basically, the correlation is so low that scientifically, it's not telling you about identification. And basically, after a person has subjectively done a comparison and said, your guy's included, it adds no probability weight. It's just a number that's produced that's basically a random number. There's no scientific basis for it. There's never been a validation study. There's been no publications. It doesn't separate mixtures. And what I want to talk about is why it might be susceptible to challenge. So here is another reanalysis that was described in the Washington Post four years ago. The state of Virginia reevaluated DNA evidence in 375 cases. And what they did is they had cybernetics here in Pittsburgh use our true allele system to reevaluate much of this evidence. Here's the difference. True allele is extensively tested. It's been around for 15 years. It has determined error rates that have been published. They're quite low, but you can tell based on match statistics what the chance of a false inclusion would be. There so far have been seven peer-reviewed journal articles that are only about validation, showing why the method is sensitive or specific or or reliable, as opposed to nothing for CPI. It's based on generally accepted science of probability. It's overcome admissibility challenges in six states, and in Pennsylvania, it has appellate precedent from the Kevin Foley case from six years ago. There are crime labs that are using it in the US and around the world, and in our office, we've done over 250 cases, 60 in Pennsylvania and 35 in Pittsburgh. The result of this work produced a scientific paper a year and a half ago. It's called Truly Old Casework on Virginia DNA Mixture Evidence, Comparing Computer and Manual Interpretation in 72 Reported Criminal Cases. It was authored jointly with the Virginia Crime Lab. It's online, it's in plus one, it's open access. If you skip the math, but just read the words and look at the pictures, it has a wealth of information in it because it shows scientifically why the prevalent methods don't work. The conclusions, this is the end of the abstract, the computer could make genotype comparisons that were impossible or impractical using manual methods. 
And every one of these words in blue is backed up by another results section. The true allele method is sensitive, meaning it finds the right answer when it's there. It's specific. It doesn't falsely include people. It's precise in the sense that if you run the system multiple times, you get comparable answers. It's accurate, which was an interesting part of the paper, and more informative than manual interpretation. And essentially, it can do things that human review can't and provide reliable scientific evidence. There were two more papers published this summer in the Journal of Forensic Sciences. So with that background and a little bit of interest, I like to talk about some of the basic things that you might think about when you have CPI max statistics, which is really all you have now in the States. And these ideas apply to whatever's going forward in many of the crime labs in the next five or 10 years. So there's the title of the paper. There's some issues you know, with inclusion probability. Rule 401 says evidence should make a fact more or less probable. But if the probative value of the match statistic is nil, then it's not doing a great job of making anything more or less probable. And then you might ask, why is DNA even coming in if there's no probative value to it? That is, if there's no match statistic, what's the probative value of DNA? The best example for this that I like is the concept of a nose, right? Your client has a nose, and the person seen has a nose. That's a match. Scientifically, that's a match. But what's the chance of a coincidence? Without a match statistic, you don't know what the coincidence is. That's why it's important. And rule 403, federally it's substantially, but at the state it's that the probative value shouldn't be outweighed by a danger of, well, unfair prejudice. If you hear the word DNA, you know, and you're a defense attorney, you might run the other way screaming, right? So might a jury. A random number can definitely confuse the issues. If the match statistic is a million, what does it mean? You know, a nice random number. It can mislead a jury into thinking that there actually is probative value when there isn't. And if it's not doing anything other than saying, I subjectively found an inclusion, and here's the number I put with it, it's a little bit cumulative. So you might want to think about whether or not judges like it, a motion to exclude based on relevance. What about reliability? In Pennsylvania, there's the issue, it's a fry state, is the expert's knowledge helping a trier of fact understand the evidence or determine a fact an issue? If you're dealing with an opinion masquerading as objective science, perhaps not. Is the methodology generally accepted in the relevant field? That's interesting. The relevant field are the scientists who develop and test these methods, not the practitioners who just put numbers into computer programs and don't actually assess these methods at all. In practice, whenever I've done a Fry hearing, Daubert factors always come in because judges consider those. Has CPI been tested? No. Has there an error rate been established? No. Has there been any validation? No. Has the validation been peer reviewed? Well, no, there hasn't been a validation, so it's hard to get that peer reviewed. So even though I wish you luck with this, you might want to consider a motion to exclude on a 702 basis for reliability. What about expert qualification? Well, lab analysts are phenomenal at generating really high quality DNA data from evidence. This is what they do. And their data is phenomenal, but they lack expertise in a lot of what goes into interpreting that data in any quantitative way. They generally don't have a mathematics background. They don't know probability theory. They don't have a background in modeling variation of the natural occurring changes in nature and how you would capture that in mathematics or with computers. The analyses they do tend to be qualitative. I won't go into it in this talk, but the starting point is to discard the quantitative information and data. So I don't have much experience with a quantitative analysis that lets you separate out mixtures. And they have essentially no experience with validating these methods of analyzing mixtures. In fact, in speaking with the people who brought these methods on board, what they've told me is that that's why these overly simplistic mixture interpretation methods like CPI where you use thresholds, you throw out most of the data, you make subjective inclusions, and then you gussy it up with some random number and call that a statistic. That's why they were developed and they were promoted. A simple rule, draw a line, count things, put things into some FBI software, replaces the solid science that is and has been available for some time.
Perhaps the most mileage you would get would be on cross-examination. If you cross-examine a DNA expert from a lab who's generated match statistics on their data, they know their data very well, but they don't know the match statistics very well. They don't know the basis of their own methods. They don't know why it would be reliable or not. And here are some questions, but this actually could be an entire day long workshop of just cross examination of experts who know absolutely nothing about the interpretation of their evidence, their methods or other methods. So you can begin, is the DNA a mixture of two or more people? How did you calculate the match statistic? You know, I applied a threshold, I took some numbers, I put them into the FBI software. What's the scientific basis of that calculation? Well, that's a great question because there is none. And the usual answer is the FBI is taking care of it. That's what it always comes down to. I'm using the FBI software. It must be reliable. But then you can go further. What's their scientific basis? And they, of course, they wouldn't know. Have you or others validated your CPI match statistic for mixtures? They wouldn't know, but it hasn't happened. Um, what's the false positive rate? I think they'd be shocked to hear there is a false positive rate. How's the reliability been demonstrated? Again, you'll start getting fairly random answers. Are there peer-reviewed validation studies? Well, no. Are, actually, are there papers about CPI that describe the procedure in a peer-reviewed journal? The answer is yes, and that will be given as an answer as opposed to has it been tested and validated? That won't be given because those papers don't exist. Is there any controversy? Well, yes, papers have been written and presentations given for 10 years as to why CPI doesn't work. Also of interest might be post-conviction relief. And I spoke with some people who do this over the last few weeks. I'm involved in cases like that in Maryland and Indiana, where there's actually been some success in using true allele to say it's a new method. So let's analyze some old evidence for people who've been in jail for 10 or 20 years. And it kind of goes into three phases under the PCRA in Pennsylvania. As I was told, first, the eligibility for post-conviction relief would largely rest with ineffective assistance of counsel to the extent to which everything I've talked about before has not been pursued. And also, the unavailability of exculpatory evidence that has subsequently become available. That's the main sort of argument. Now, the issue there that's happened in the courts is that, well, okay, so the forensic science was bogus, tough. That's kind of what the courts, I'm, I'm told, will do. So what you might need to do is to get a, a newer technology come in. That's the kind of cases I've been involved in, uh, Innocence Project and so on, where in the second part, post-conviction DNA testing, we'll now get real technology that's reliable coming in. It may work in your favor or not, but at least it's real. It's telling you what's actually there. But of real interest is something that the Pennsylvania Innocence Project in Philadelphia had an amicus brief about and actually won. Have people heard of Hentak Lee versus Monroe County? So everything was denied at the state level and then as well at the district level, but the appeals court said that the expert testimony at trial was fundamentally unreliable, and so the prisoner was entitled to federal habeas relief without needing to introduce a new method. It was, the arson evidence was just that bad. That's a, that's a really interesting case. Okay, so in conclusion, much DNA mixture interpretation is unreliable. Most of what you see in DNA reports, actually, from government labs. And this is something I hear from other people, whether it's defenders, prosecutors, police. Inconclusive in a DNA report means call cybergenetics. Or get a computer, do something. But uh, don't just accept at face value that there's no information in the DNA. If there's a pulse in the data, if there's any signal at all, there's usually information in there. The crime lab match statistics are often inaccurate. And there are challenges that you can think of based on relevance, reliability, the expert's expertise, and a very vigorous and, as time and experience proceed, perhaps withering cross-examination of the real defect in the DNA evidence, which is the statistical interpretation. There's the opportunity to pursue actual innocence through post-conviction relief. 
And the main motivation here is that good science should be leading to fair trials. So thank you very much. And for more information, there is a lot of entertaining materials, hundreds of articles and videos on our website. Thanks a lot.